We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. How indebted are we to the book of Acts? We are indebted to it for its vision of the early church, for the stories it tells of the victory of the gospel, for the way it reminds us of our own priorities in the church, the way it calls us to reflect our forefathers in the faith as they founded the gathering of God's people, as the gospel expanded, for the way it motivates us that despite every hurdle and obstacle, the gospel will continue to advance in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 6 is no exception. We're, we are indebted to the first half of Acts chapter 6 for the way it instructs us in a very particular way in the church, the way it deals with a very particular need, very particular problem. So let's read it. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 6 through verse 7. Let's read together. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Perhaps you've heard the expression, I expect you have, Houston, we have a problem. Perhaps you've seen the movie or read a book or report, news report of Apollo 13. Perhaps you might even remember that in your own lifetime. What a sweet thing that would be to have that kind of wisdom to look back at that moment, unlike some of us for whom it is ancient history. <laughs> Houston, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. So said the astronauts on the Apollo 13 mission, and actually their problems were multiplied. If you've watched the movie, seen the story, read anything about it, you know uh, of the number of obstacles that the astronauts and the ground control had to overcome in order to make this mission uh, not a disaster. Well, uh, part of that story involves a man named Jerry Woodfill and another man named Don Arabian. Jerry was in charge of the, basically the early warning system that was present so that they would be alerted when problems took place uh, in the space shuttle. And then Don Arabian was an engineer in charge of, of fixing and coming up with a solution to uh, problems that they faced, at least one problem in particular. Well, one of the problems that took place was that because they had to move uh, into this small module in order to get home because of damage, uh, the carbon monoxide filters were insufficient. They were rated for just a couple of men for a couple of days. They had to support three men for four days, and they were overloaded. The men were going to literally choke on their own breath. They had to come up with a solution, and they had to come up with it quickly. The experts, it says, and the MER had 24 hours to deal with the challenge and solve the problem. So Woodfill was there because he was in charge of the light that had come up and explaining what it was communicating about uh, the carbon uh, dioxide poison. And then Arabian, this other engineer, was in charge of coming up with a solution with his team. And Woodfield says, my recollection of the threat besides the earlier meeting was Don's voice bellowing in the mission evaluation room that Tuesday. I need those guys to come up with an answer on the CO2 thing and to do it fast. 
He was referring to the Tiger team, led by Ed Smiley, the cruise systems manager, working in the problem. And if you know the story at all, you know that what they came up with was brilliant and shocking in its ingenuity. Using only the type of equipment and tools the crew had on board, which obviously they had to use, including plastic bags, cardboard, suit hoses, and duct tape, Smiley and his team conceived a configuration that just might work. The concept seemed to evolve as all looked on, Woodfill said. It was to attach a suit hose into a port, which blew air through the hose into an astronaut's spacesuit. If the spacesuit was eliminated and instead the output of the hose somehow attached to the square filter, perhaps the crew could be saved. This, in effect, would bypass the barrel. The air blown through the filter by the suit fan would have no carbon dioxide as it re-entered the cabin atmosphere. The biggest challenge was attaching the hose into a funnel-like device, having a small round inlet hole for the suit hose and a much larger square outlet attached and surrounding the square filter. Thus, as it was said, they had to come up with a round peg, peg that would fit in a square hole. But the funnel would most likely leak. Then the thought came, use cardboard logbooks to covers to support the plastic, and it worked. But more importantly, they had to figure out how the funnel could be fashioned to prevent leaking. And of course, the solution to every conceivable naughty problem has got to be duct tape, which they had on board. And so it was, and the rest of the story is history. These men frantically and yet calmly came up with a solution that would rescue these astronauts so that they could fly this craft home and the mission ultimately of saving them would be preserved. Remarkable. Well, Act 6 tells a similar story. It's a story of a problem. Houston, we have a problem arising in the church. It is a significant problem. It has the potential to be a life or death problem for this brand new multicultural community. It is a problem. And yet, in order to preserve that mission, certain men cannot be focused on that problem. And so other people have to be deployed to solve that problem. There is a problem there is a wrong solution and a right solution, and then there is the result. That's the way Acts 6 is told. So what I want to do this morning is I want to, I want to walk through this story, and I want to use three sections. The problem, the solution, and the result. And you see if you see a similarity in how the Houston engineers solved this problem. And what took place? First of all, the problem. It says in verse 1 that in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose. And don't, don't we think that would be the normal thing that would happen? I mean, the thousands of people that have come to faith from different cultural backgrounds, some of them have different primary languages. It is just not surprising if you've been in church longer than like four minutes that eventually something's going to happen where somebody's offended at somebody else. And I'm so grateful to Luke that he includes this story in the book of Acts because he just makes our kind of church life seem normal. Oh, good. Well, it's good to hear they weren't constantly just selling their lands and helping the poor and preaching the gospel and experiencing faith in the midst of suffering. I'm glad to hear that somebody was still sinning. Otherwise, I would experience uh, a measure of discouragement about my church life. They have this problem. There's a complaint the Hellenists would have been primary Greek speakers. They were probably Jews from other parts of the Roman Empire that had come to Jerusalem and then had gotten saved and are now joined into the church. They may have been locals that just came from another culture. They spoke primarily Greek. That's their main distinction. And because of the thousands of disciples that have been saved, inevit inevitably, uh, widows are present in the church and because of their gospel identity, the church wants to care for those widows, so they've developed some kind of distribution system, as you would have to with any kind of church that size. But somehow, the Hebrews, that would be primarily Aramaic-speaking Jews, their widows are getting uh, plenty in what they need, but the Hellenists are not. So there's a disparity, and these Greek speakers raise a complaint. Our widows are being neglected. Now, now this problem is administrative but potentially devastating. Here's why. 
in a church that is trying to combine this many cultural backgrounds, different primary languages and speaking, anything that would spark an essentially cultural divide could be devastating. If you think about it, if it's not solved, the result could be the Jewish leaders who are already antagonistic against the church could claim, you guys have no future. You can't even get along with each other. You can't even care for your own widows. And this movement is, as it were, stop before it begins. There's a sense of tension that's potential. There's division that's potential. The question of whether Jesus Christ is a sufficient unifier for people from different cultures is being present in this problem. Now, maybe it just started because Agnes raised her hand and said, I didn't get any vegetables last week. But the result of it could be this church is divided. It is split between cultures. And the whole point of a gospel that is global, that is multinational, that is multicultural, uniting people from different tribes and languages, is destroyed when the Jerusalem church cannot find a way to be unified. This is a significant problem. Jesus had told his apostles, go into all the nations and make disciples. I have other sheep not of this flock. He had heard, you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. And here we have the first indication that the ends of the earth are hard to bring together. What will happen? It's a problem. It's a big problem. Surely the Jewish leaders are looking for any reason to accuse the Jerusalem church of being an unworthy movement, unworthy of followers. They can't even take care of their widows. They look out for themselves. Could have been a devastating critique of this church. So there's a problem. What are they going to do? Verse 2, the solution. Verse 2 through 6 is essentially the solution that the 12 apostles come up with. The, two, that the 12 gather the full number of the disciples, and they first say what the solution should not be. They first say what it should not be. And frankly, this is kind of surprising. In light of the magnitude of this problem, in light of the potential for division, in light of the newness and fragility of this church, you would think that if not Peter, one of the 12, surely one of them can be spared to bring their stature and their influence. I mean, they are the witnesses of the risen Christ. If they come in and say, here's how we're organizing this, most people are going to just do what they say. You would think that they would devote themselves, some part of themselves, to leading this task. But they immediately, before the gathered church, say it is not right. The connotation of the word there is that it is not right before the Lord. It is an inappropriate thing for us to do that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So the first thing they say of the solution is what the solution should not be. And again, it's surprising in light of the potential of the problem. The apostles considered it a wrong decision for them to directly prioritize the leading and solving problem of this issue. That is not what they should do. It is not right, they say. Now, a couple of caveats about this. The apostles clearly understood, because they had watched Jesus for three years, that all disciples are called to serve in any manner of lowly fashion. So this is not a statement that they in themselves are too important to do some lesser task. And I think as Americans, because we think of everything in terms of hierarchy, we could read this this way. Well, yeah, I mean, the CEO doesn't do what a janitor does. That would be inappropriate. He's the CEO. But we tend to think that's because he's more important. That's not the way the Bible thinks at all. The Bible doesn't think any person is too important for a certain task. It doesn't mean it would have been wrong in any case for Peter to help somebody to their chair or to serve at a table or to do some lowly, meaningful task. After all, they had watched Jesus wash their feet, and no one who had seen that could think that they were above any kind of task, no matter how menial. So this is not about the apostles in themselves are too important. And you notice that even in their response. 
they don't say it is beneath us to serve the tables. So we have to kind of clear out our American view of hierarchy that can kind of creep even into the church. But we do have to uphold the priority of their primary calling. Notice it says, here's what we would have to do. In order to give this significant need the attention it requires, we would have to give up preaching the word of God in order to serve the tables. This is not a question of personal importance. It's a question of primary calling and the essence of the mission's viability. That's what they're saying. They're saying, brothers, we, we have a calling and we've seen the effectiveness when we devote ourselves to what God has called us to, to proclaim the word and to pray over the advance of the gospel. This calling, this ministry must not be sacrificed even for so important a need and dangerous a problem as we're experiencing in this complaint. We must not, they say, give up the preaching of the word of God. And we've seen in Acts why this is so important. The very growth of the church, the maturation of the believers, the proclamation of Jesus Christ and his gospel has been given to them as their responsibility. And this gospel has proved fruitful. People have been saved. The church is being built up. The church itself, it says, devoted itself to the teaching of the apostles. And we know because we've, we've read in the scriptures about the power of God's word and the ability of that word to change hearts and break the stony ground and sow seeds that will produce a harvest. That, that They're right. This can't be sacrificed no matter what the cost. So, so no, you, you shouldn't stop what you're doing in order to do this. This must be Maintain the church's essential need is the preaching and prayer of those called to this ministry. And though they are only servants, they must serve in the task that their master has given to them. So they come up with what should be the solution. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But notice the repetition. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You notice what is also not present is the, the presence of lazy apostles. Oh, those Hellenistic widows. Can't be bothered with helping them with their cabbage delivery. This is too much work. No, we will devote ourselves, says Peter. We will give ourselves diligently to our task, but let's find those that the church can note and commend and we can appoint to a task of this important ministry, this administrative, this practical ministry that's going to require a specific kind of leadership. So here's the solution that is required. Find godly men. They need to have a good reputation because this is the church. Let them be full of the Spirit because they will need the power of the Spirit to accomplish this task. Let them be full of wisdom so that they can discern what is needed in this tricky, racially charged, perhaps culturally charged environment. We need men who can be godly in the task of practical service. We need those who can uh, exhibit the wisdom of the Spirit in a situation where carnal cravings are present. We need men who have reputation and stature so that the church can follow them and trust them as they come up with solutions. We, we need leaders of practical ministry who will lead that practical ministry in a godly way. Now, just a quick point about leadership in the church of, of any variety. Leadership in the church is different from leadership in the world precisely at this point. In the world, pretty much all we care about is competence. That is elevated massively above anything else. Now, we, we would love competence and character, but if you're competent, we actually don't mind that much if you don't have a lot of character all the time. I mean, I, if, if you can make sure my roof stops leaking, I, I'm not necessarily looking for you always to be this stalwart, upstanding individual. Good price, fixed roof. It's not a primary concern. When people in the world are looking for leaders, the CEO trying to find a CFO for his company is not necessarily looking for the man full of the spirit and of wisdom and of good stature in the church. It's like, can you balance the books and protect our financial situation? 
It's the way the world thinks. It's a bottom line thinking. The church is different because their bottom line is different. They want people full of the wisdom of the spirit and full of stature in the church, a good godly reputation. And they say, commend these kinds of people to us so that we can appoint them to this task. So what's the solution to this problem? Houston, we have a problem. Okay, first thing is we have a certain task. We know that can't be sacrificed. So those called to that task must not allow themselves to be divided in their focus. They have to keep doing that. That's essential. So the Lord must have another plan. I know. Let's raise up men who are godly, faithful, filled with the Spirit, those who can serve in this way and deal with this solution. That, that, that will be the solution that God will bring to us. That's what we'll, that's what we'll do. So they, they choose these men. And we're introduced to them. A couple of them, at least, will play other roles as the story progresses. What they said, it says in verse 5, pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. And the list goes on. These are all Greek names. Wisdom in that, because the Greek speakers were the ones that had the problem, and so Greek leaders will deal with that challenge to ensure that their widows are well provided for and cared for. And the reputation of the gospel community does not suffer. They appoint these men to the task, those commended by the church, and they pray for them and lay, lay, their, lay their hands on them. I think that's supposed to indicate the importance of this task, the value of it, the almost essential nature of this practical leadership. Though the apostles cannot give themselves to it, someone must do it, and it is deeply important for the well-being of the church. It is deeply valuable for the reputation of the community. The gospel is at stake in these men's service, both in preserving the preaching and praying calling and in providing for this need that has arisen. These, these men are crucial in their leadership of the church in some practical ways. So they choose. Very, very valuable to see this. Acts 6 is not in the Bible as an interesting historical footnote. It's in the Bible to communicate a principle about the advance of the gospel. Let me say it again. Acts 6 is not in the Bible as an interesting historical footnote. I've said this before. Narrative in the Bible is not just to help you pass Bible history class. What happened in Acts 6? They chose seven guys to help with food distribution. Check. A for us. No, it's supposed to inspire us to reflect and respond to the principles they give us. It's to show us the connection between their solution to this problem and our solution to the same problem we're going to have and the result that will come about as we do this. So that's the third point, the result. There's a problem, there's a solution, and then there's a result. And then I'm going to look into some application for us. The result. The result in verse 7 is very important. Luke inserts this periodically. I'm sure you've noticed this before. Periodically throughout the book, it's kind of like the so what sections of Acts. So what? So this happened. They chose these guys. So what? Here's the result. Verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase. Now notice, at the beginning of the passage, the disciples were increasing in number. The end of the passage, the word of God continued to increase. In the middle of the passage, we must not neglect the ministry of the word. We will devote ourselves to the ministry of the word. What's the point? The word of the gospel of Jesus Christ will continue to advance. And one way it will advance is when the office of preaching and prayer is preserved and yet practical leadership is upheld and appointed in the church. What will be the result, the word will continue to increase. And not only that, the number of the disciples will multiply greatly in Jerusalem. And not only that, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So lest we think, Luke is saying, that this is merely a historical fo footnote. Oh, interesting how they did mercy ministry in the early church. No, this type of practical leadership is a component that is essential to the multiplying of the very word of God. And even the priests, those opposed to the gospel, become convicted and respond in obedience to the faith. This is supposed to be a, a triumphant verse in verse 7. 
Look at what happened. The word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And even those priests, you remember those men who were just a chapter ago accusing and, or two chapters ago and, 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 and threatening the apostles? Even some of them become obedient to the faith. Problem. Solution. Result. What's the point of all of this? How can we summarize it in a phrase? I would say it this way. God will advance his gospel through practical servant leadership that preserves the ministry of the word and prayer. God will advance his gospel through practical servant leadership that preserves the ministry of the word and prayer. Isn't that what you see as you look at this passage? What's, what's the point we're supposed to take about this? Or we don't want it just to just be a history lesson. What's the point? God will advance his gospel. They're increasing at the beginning. There's a problem. There's a solution. It's increasing at the end. What's the point? The gospel about Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, will continue to advance in the hearts and lives of those who hear it. The gospel of Jesus Christ will continue to go forward. And what is a crucial element of that advance? It's the appointing of practical servant leadership that simultaneously preserves those who are called to proclaim this gospel and to pray over the well-being of the church. Good news, isn't it? Good news. Good news that the story doesn't end and the church was divided and there was a great split that day and the Greeks met in one gathering and the Hebrews in another and great shame came upon the gospel and many priests accelerated their opposition to the church. Isn't this a much better story? To have an Act 6, much better story. This is a good story. It's instructive to us. It, it motivates us. It teaches us. It reminds us. It protects us. It inspires us. It's important for us. Good news. Okay, several applications. I want to give us four. Four applications because there's some things that are very similar for us, some things that are not. But often in these cases, the principles are timeless. The principles are timeless. And that, that one principle, what does that mean for us? That God will continue, still to this day, he will advance his gospel through practical servant leadership in the church that preserves the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay, application number one. The need for godly leadership of practical ministry will arise in the church. <laughs> Maybe an obvious thing, but it's, it's worth stating. The need for godly leadership of practical ministry will arise in the church. It will arise in the church. You know, I, I think that in our culture, uh, we are, are deeply affected by a sort of a a professionalism, a, a sort of a consumerism uh, as we walk into any event, any gathering. We are basically expect, we assume that our walking into a, a moment, and we're, we're instantly sort of evaluating what's the effectiveness of this event as it relates to me as a consumer. We, we all do this. My wife uh, has said that when she's traveled in Europe, one of the marks that she's noted about Americans, um, and I've never taken her, this was, this was other people that took her, because I've kept her, you know, in America where it's, nothing's fun to do. But in Europe, she said, one of the marks of Americans is they're loud and they demand things all the time. It's terribly embarrassing. And so you go and you can just expect there's somebody shouting at somebody over there and they're demanding, where's my room or where's my meal or whatever. You can bet it's going to be an American. And you look and you think, oh, yep, yep, that guy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Thank you for that reputation you just perpetrated uh, around the world. We, we tend to do that because that's who we are and we have rights and we can demand things and so forth. But in the church, in the church, we can't bring in that mindset. We, we can't bring in that mindset. There has to be this expectation. Needs are going to arise in the church. The, the church is not this super spiritual atmosphere where we walk in and everything's uh, perfect all the time and we just enjoy and receive. No, needs are going to arise that are going to be made known because somebody experiences them like these widows did. Isn't it good that the first church had something happen that, that didn't work? It's kind of broke down. And so you have Agatha or whoever come and say, uh, there's a number of us and we didn't get any food. 
This is a problem. Like, it's so comforting to know that because doesn't it sound like real church? Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's, there's no chairs where we're supposed to sit. Or I don't know if you're aware of this, but the back row did not get a communion cup this morning. Or I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the curtain just fell on someone's head. Or I don't know if you're aware of this, but the lock on the truck, it's broken and it won't open and we can't get the sound system in. Or I don't know if you're aware of this, but I, I haven't gotten uh, this letter that I was supposed to get to help me with this situation. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Needs will arise in the church. That's normal. That's normal. And I want to commend you as a pastor because our experience has been that you, you, the membership of this church, you respond to these moments beautifully. Our experience is when needs arise in the church, their response is humility and willingness to serve and how can we, th that, is, that is our normal experience in this church. Oh, is there, is there a way I can help? Or look, I totally understand. There's a lot going on. Or that kind of humble response and part of that humble response is based on looking at Acts chapter 6 and saying, even the early church had needs that arose in the church. They had to kind of figure out and strategize. It, it's good for the church to accept the reality. Needs are going to, practical needs are going to arise in the church. The need for a fresh look and fresh organization and fresh appointing of people, that's going to arise in the church. It arose in this church. It's going to arise in our church. If something hasn't happened to you already, it will at some point. At some point, you're going to be like one of these people who said, um, I don't think this is what was meant to happen, but I, 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 nothing that was supposed to happen happened towards me. Needs will arise in the church. It, it's good to absorb that, accept that, see that, embrace that, anticipate that. So don't be surprised by practical needs in the church that may have a significant impact on you. Don't, don't be surprised by them. Anytime you get a bunch of non-gods together, things that don't work are going to happen. It's good to be aware of that. It's good to anticipate that. The need for godly leadership of practical ministry will arise in the church. Second application. Pastors must faithfully prioritize teaching and prayer. Pastors must faithfully prioritize teaching and prayer. Now, pastors are not apostles. Important to see a distinction. And yet, pastors are similar in that they are called primarily to the preaching of the Word of God and to prayer for the church. Primarily, the calling of a pastor is to bring the Word of God into connection with the people of God and to pray over them earnestly and eagerly to care through teaching. That is primarily what a pastor does. Whether he does that individually across the table from someone in a one-on-one -on -one meeting at Starbucks and he brings the word of God into connection to the need of God's people. Or he does that in a, a class context or he does that in a small group gathering where he's bringing principles of God's word to bear on how we relate together in fellowship. Or he does that in a Sunday morning context. But wherever that's happening, that's essentially the role of the pastor. It's to prioritize the teaching of God's word and especially the gospel and to give themselves to prayer dependence on God for the ultimate spiritual direction and well-being of the church now a couple caveats this is not an excuse for pastors to be lazy or proud in their work rather it's a calling to keep a close eye on what kind of work they are primarily giving their time to Another caveat, this does not mean that a pastor should never serve in practical ways, as if he should, maybe we should freak out if we ever see a pastor helping to set up chairs or providing some kind of administrative leadership in a certain way. This is not, a, a, the, the, the right result of this passage is, I think, frankly, abused in a number of churches um, and, and ministries around the world where there's this idea that this is the holy man and let's make sure he has every comfort attendant to and he shouldn't think about anything um, at all except for him and, and God. No, that is not the application of this passage. Paul himself uh, mended things and worked on things in order to support his ministry in different times. Jesus washed feet. They walked places. They weren't carried around like demigods or something. This is not a, a desire to exalt pastors as men in some particular way. 
No, not at all. Please don't do that. Please, please don't do that. It'll be extremely difficult for me and Aaron if, if that starts to be the application. Please don't. We're just people. Just people in the church, all right? It's not about the person. This is about a task and the priority of their task. Pastors should still help in their own homes with cleaning up the bathroom and things like that, okay? Pastors should still be willing to jump in when there's everybody working in physical labor. Yes, they should. But it does mean that pastors' primary energy, focus, and time should be given to the ministry of the word and prayer. It does mean that. It does mean that it requires a certain discipline to say, though, and my experience, especially of Aaron and Bart, is that th their desire is to do. <laughs> they want to go do. They, they want to be the one that goes and picks up such and such for the meeting. They, they want to be out there setting up the chairs. It takes a certain discipline to say, yes, but... I, it would be better for me to minister the word and prayer in this particular way right now, preparation for a teaching or counseling this person or preparing for this kind of study that I have to do to teach in a certain way. And, and oh, I, I would love to be with everybody and working in this particular way, but I need to prioritize this focus right now. Pastor's primary energy, focus, and time should be given to the ministry of the word and prayer. Now, the church... The church should celebrate and protect this priority. And if you can receive this as, I'm saying this also as a member of the church, and I think that you do a fantastic job of this. The church should celebrate and protect this priority and look for ways to ensure that it is present. The pastor is simply another servant with a particular gift and calling in the church. And like every person, they should be gently but firmly encouraged to pursue this calling and gift that God has given to them so that the church can prosper spiritually and the gospel can advance. So, second application. Pastors must faithfully prioritize teaching and prayer. You should hold us accountable to this priority. This is an appropriate area of congregational accountability for their pastors. Are you giving time, sufficient time, to the ministry of the word and prayer? You must do this. This is your calling. The gospel calls you to this. Do not neglect the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay, the need for godly eldership leadership of practical ministry will arise. Pastors must faithfully prioritize teaching and prayer. Third application, the church should rejoice in the appointment of godly leaders over practical ministry. The church should rejoice in the appointment of godly leaders over practical ministry. You notice that it says that this seemed good. You notice it says that after they, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, verse uh, five, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they immediately go about commending these men, choosing them and putting them before the apostles. So the church should rejoice in the appointment of godly leaders over practical ministry. So a couple of applications. If, if you know of someone that you believe fits these characteristics, godly, full of the spirit and wisdom, please commend them uh, to us so that we can look for ways for them to serve. Also, you can look for ways to encourage those who are already serving in significant areas of practical ministry in the church. No better example of this than Mark Wally which if he was here, I would have everybody clap for him, but he's on vacation, thankfully. No better example of this than Mark Wally. He, he serves in practical ministry of need, needs that are significant and essential to the life of the church. He does that with joy, with effectiveness, with faithfulness. I could also think of a number of individuals. I can't list all of them, but just several. Uh, you think of like Glenn, who comes early on, on Sunday morning, or Brett, who comes early on Sunday morning. You might think of the, anybody on the, on the usher teams. A number, a list of, of people. Chase that comes early. Catherine Davidson has been early at the church for years and years, serving to set up things, practical ministry. And Chase, had for years, oversaw that team and, and positioned them. He provided leadership for that group so that they could serve effectively in the church. There, there should be a, a desire to encourage those who have been appointed these tasks. I think about someone like, like Robert Feldner, who for years has come early to the church, organized the sound team, provided practical leadership for an essential need in the church so that you can hear my voice right now. 
essential need. We, we could go down the list. There's, there's many people who serve in these ways, and, and particularly those who lead significant areas of ministry. Let's encourage them. Let's thank them. Let's be like the early church where it, it, it's right and it, it pleases us, and we express that through encouragement. Thank you for doing what the early church saw was necessary to the advance of the gospel. Thank you for providing for the church in these practical ways. We could also look for ways that we can support those leading in practical ministry and make their job easier. A ask them, if you're on their team, how you can be an easier person to lead. H how can I make your job easy? This practical issue is essential for the church. I want to make it easy to, to serve in this way. Or if you're not serving anywhere in a practical way in the church, I, I would look, look for one of those people that's leading one of those teams and find a way to get involved in that. Because this practical ministry, it is essential to the advance of the gospel. And those leading that ministry should experience the encouragement and gratefulness and eager support of the church. Look, how can I, how can I help you? I, I don't want to be one of those that just walks into the church and receives and walks out and evaluates. No, I don't, don't want to be that kind of church. How can I jump in? How can I serve? Give me a place. Give me a spot. There's got to be something I can do to make your job, your task of practical leadership easier. Help me help me find, find me a place somewhere there's got to be somewhere a place where I can contribute because I want to see and be a part of verse 7 I want to play my part in supporting you in your practical leadership so that verse 7 can have my name and my investment on it as well I want to be a part of verse 7 I want to be about I, I want to be a part of verse 7 I want to say yeah I I was a part of that I was on Stephen's team. I was on Philip's team. Yeah, the word advanced. I, I, I carried some of those buckets of food to those widows. I helped in this practical area. I helped you in your practical leadership of the church. And we made sure those called to preaching and prayer were doing that primarily. And we saw the gospel go forward. I want to be a part of that. So yes, rejoicing in men or those called to practical leadership in the church can, can include and should include the desire to serve and help and support them. Fourth application, finally. We should be confident. I think confidence is undervalued in the church of God. We get dependence sometimes that we should pray. We don't always get confidence, assurance. Act 6 is designed to give us confidence. It's designed to call us and to give us confidence. We should be confident that as servant leaders are deployed in the church, as the word and prayer continues to be prioritized, the gospel will advance in and through our church. In and through our church, Redemption Hill Church. Let this motivate us, brothers and sisters. Let it motivate us. Let it motivate us that we serve the same God who advanced the gospel in the Jerusalem church and as we fulfill the gifts and callings God has given to each one of us, especially as godly servant leadership is deployed, as the word is preached and prayer is raised, the gospel goes forward. The gospel will not be stopped by disunity in the church. It will not be stopped by disjointed pastoral ministry. God has made a way for it to advance and advance it will. Good news. I, I love the practical nature of Acts chapter 6. You have Acts chapter 5 where Ananias and Sapphira are executed by God for their sin of lying against God. It's a very supernatural kind of moment. And then you move into Acts 6 and it's this very natural kind of moment. Okay, there's some disorganization in the distribution of food. What could be more practical than that? And yet it has all these potential tension moments. Can buckets of food stop the gospel, possibly, when even priests and lying people in the church couldn't do it? If you've been in the church any amount of time, you know that some of the most devastating things in the church start in the most small, practical ways. But God has made a way where godly, practical leadership can be raised up where the ministry of the word can be preserved and proclaimed. We can have confidence that as we fulfill this same vision here and there in different ways in our church, the gospel will go forward here from us. It's good news. God didn't write Acts chapter 6 to just talk about the glory days of the past. 
He gave it to us to inspire and build our confidence for right now what God is able to do within us. And I want to conclude by saying I am so grateful, so grateful that I'm bringing this message to a serving church, to a serving church. Just this morning, walked in, there's everybody serving and they're having trouble with the sound system, but people are smiling and they're saying, well, we got to work on this. This is a problem. And they're smiling and people are setting up curtains and running in to get stuff set up in children's ministry. I walked into the class, all the chairs were already set up. I didn't have to do a thing. I just walked in, all the chairs were set up. They're all done. The podium was there. Everything was there. Some, somebody has worked on setting up coffee, was bustling down the hallway as I walked in, setting up coffee so we could have something to drink. Well, we're filled with serving church. People host small groups. People lead ministries. They, they come up with needs and good solutions and practical organization for the well-being. People count what we give every week so we can have financial integrity in the church. People, have, for, for years, we've had people take that so that I didn't have to look at it or touch it or Aaron didn't take what was given to the bank and, and put it in a secure way so that we don't have to be involved in that at all. People serve over evaluating our finances. People serve all over this church. So you're to be commended because there is practical leadership taking place in this church and because the church rejoices in that leadership and celebrates it and desires to see the word of the gospel and prayer go forward, we can be confident this is happening and therefore verse 7 is taking place. The word of God will continue to increase and the gospel will go forward. You are doing this. You are doing this. So yes, we want to be provoked. And if there's ways we can serve more, great. And probably there's other leaders that can be appointed to new ministry as we continue to grow. Yes, sure there will be. But you are doing this already. And we can be confident the gospel will go forward because we're following the pattern laid down for us in the word of God. It's good news. It's good news. God is moving in our church. He's moving. I was just talking to someone this morning who was just sharing with me, I, I'm, I'm going through this book and God is using it to break down some things in my heart that have been there for years. God is, is moving in our church. He's moving through you, members of this church. And as you serve, and particularly those of you who are leading practical ministry, thank you for leading. You're doing what the Bible calls us to do. And we can have confidence that God will bring fruit as we continue to sow in ways that are in conformity to his word. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the abundance of faithful servants in this church. Lord, people serve privately from house to house. They serve in structured ways on Sunday they serve in hidden ways. They serve in seen ways. Lord, thank you for the many servants. And Lord, thank you especially for those that are, are like these seven men. They, they are examples to us. They're godly. Lord, they're statured. They're gifted. They're full of the Spirit. I thank you for those that lead ministries. Lord, may we support and make their job easy. And would you raise up new people in that regard in this church? We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for all those who serve in, in significant ways, Lord, that, that carry significant burdens of care and, and ministry. Lord, thank you for them, Lord. You know all their names. Thank you for them, Lord. Lord thank you, Lord. I, I just want to offer our gratefulness to you. These are gifts to, to this church. Thank you for those who have laid down so many hours to serve us, who sacrificed their time. Lord, thank you for the servants of this church. Thank you for Mark, Lord. Lord, thank you for Heather Hassan. Thank you for Lori Sue Prater. Thank you for Robert Feldner. Lord, thank you for Brett. Thank you for Glenn. Thank you for Juan. Thank you for Stan and Judy. Thank you for Chase. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these. And Lord, so many others. Thank you for Don and Nita. Thank you for Catherine. Thank you for the worship team, the sound team, the visual team, the ushers, the counting team. Thank you for those who do our church lunches. Thank you for the children's ministry. Thank you for the greeters. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for the hospitality team. Thank you for the finance team. Thank you for the small group leaders. So thank you for all those that are more than I can name. And thank you for those that lead them. Bless them and strengthen them and keep them and add to their number. And Lord, may the result of all this be that your gospel advances through this church in this time. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.